Hello and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for the Institute of Architecture Sliver Lecture Series entitled Kaleidoscopic Networks, highlighting architects and designers working within intricate networks and shifting systems. Tonight we are pleased to welcome Andrew Zago with the lecture entitled Incongruencies and Errors. Andrew Zago is an architect and educator. He is principal of Zago Architecture in Detroit and Los Angeles and is currently design faculty and visual studies coordinator at SIRE. His primary area of influence extends from Detroit, east to New York, and west to Los Angeles. This broad network between cities and various realms of academia, including City College of New York, Cornell University, The Ohio State University, the University of Michigan, and UCLA, has provided him with a colorful and diverse overview of the discipline of architecture. Through it all, however, he has managed to carry a coherent message devoid of overinflated arky speak. For Andrew Zago, space is a serious place. Based on his build work, it is clear that he genuinely understands the art of making buildings. He has an acute aesthetic sensibility and a precision to his work that elevates him above what Bob Zomel refers to as the sloppy earnestness. As if this was not enough, aside of architecture, he also creates autonomous studies, mostly in the form of drawings and assemblages. In fact, I first encountered Andrew Zago's work as a first-year architecture student. At this time, we were studying and admiring the complex and rigorous drawings that he produced with Tom Main in the early days of Morphosis in the late 1980s. These drawings challenged traditional conventions and ushered in new graphic in innovations, juxtaposing multiple drawings at one time. These were used to highlight and expose the spatial conditions, often creating a spatial experience on the page. Most recently, this interest to challenge traditional modes of communication has extended to film and digital processing, exploring urban and spatial analysis within the context of Detroit. Regardless of the area of research, the output with Andrew is always refined and intentional. Thank you for joining us tonight. thank the whole school for this, this uh, uh, and everyone involved with bringing me out here for this, this uh, uh, fantastic invitation. Uh, it's, just been, it's been a great couple of days here. Um, uh, oddly enough, my first time, uh, my first time to Vienna, and, and uh, in part it's odd because uh, realizing and talking with people and, and uh, running into uh, uh, different people since I've been here, you, you realize, understanding that you know, this is sort of Los Angeles' sister city, Oddly enough, it's not quite clear how that how that happened. In fact, uh, Suzanne Bottle is here. We're very happy to see her. We were talking with you about that years ago when you were a student at, at SciArc, um, which goes back. You know, so that connection must go back at least 100 years, right? Is, is, uh, is, uh, Schindler. The Schindler would be the, the beginning of that. Uh, and of course, our, our in, in California, you know, we're run by a, uh, an, uh, an Austrian. So. <laughs> have you disowned him? I'm not sure we want him, but you can have him back. <laughs> um, no, but it's not. But in particular, you know, this uh, uh, the, the the architecture cultures of uh, you know, there's a very much an active ar architectural connection between the two places, uh, and I think I think more more, more especially uh, uh, if not if not official, at least informally, between this institution and, and um, SciArc, and so I was in. It session this afternoon and someone was asking me about uh, Oxaruno, which, you know, anyone raise their hands? Just, just to hear that heard, just to hear that being talked about an odd enough uh, work that I did in, in uh, uh, my, uh, you know, first partnership with a fellow named Baram Shardell, that some of you may know, and eventually with, uh, uh, with Jeff Kipnis, when we were Shardell, Zago Kip, Kipnis. So anyways, anyone who, if I can show up in some, in some, um, Small classroom somewhere in the middle of the city I've never been, and someone's asking me about. Uh, actually, you know, I'm among friends. Uh, Rainier assured me I can speak for three hours this evening, so <laughs> it won't be that long. But I'll, I'll I'll try to make it brief. It's just a lot of stuff, but I'll just try to show a lot of pictures. And I have, a, you know, there's there's um, uh, I wanted to show this first off because as much as I admire the yellow and red uh, branding of the of, of your uh, uh, school, and the, you know, I, I thought the color of this. And, it was actually the, the idea of the misregistration, uh, which is a subtopic of some of the things that I would talk about tonight that I'm not going to get into. 
uh, that that is um, uh, sort of important. There's there's um, a couple of I'm mostly just going to show my work uh, across some of the things uh, um, uh, that, that Kristen was just talking about. I'm not going to show. I'll, I'll show fairly little. Do I have any, I don't, I'm not even sure I'm showing any built work in this, and, and frankly, I'll be showing lots of competitions that I lost. So that's you know. I guess you know if they were more of those one, I would be showing uh, more built work. I'll show a number of projects, but I wanted to intersperse in between it a few different observations that uh, I guess kind of current thoughts or, or what I might call uh, uh, notes, on, notes on the art or notes on the profession that in part, I, you know, I won't draw a one-to-one -one correlation between a couple of the things that I'm talking about. Um, that would be a little premature, but I will, I will show, uh, I guess, uh, some thoughts on where, um, not so much on what the state of architecture is right now. That's a little bit difficult to put your finger on, but the kind of thing that a lot of uh, a lot of us are anxious about, and I'm sure a lot of you in the audience are as well. Which is, uh, where where are things going with the realization that we live in a uh, in a culture and in a in a discipline that, uh, for better or worse, uh, and as much as one might may not wish it to be so, uh, we tend to we tend to consume. Uh, positions and breakthroughs and sensibilities uh, almost as fast as one can create them. And, and I think there is a responsibility, which maybe I can touch on, uh, whether one, one wants to kind of um, figure out where in advance in front of sensibilities is. I think one, one sort of has to do that. Uh, I guess it's also because I recently had a chance to write a couple of essays, which I don't do so often. One, which there's a bootleg copy floating around her non-studio. Uh, on the awkward, and, and another one that's uh, I, I just presented at Princeton in the fall on, on the accident, and I'll talk about those both uh, briefly. Um, uh, Show this in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, and I, it's sort of you know thinking uh, just a way of introduction of a kind of um, problematic in architecture for. Architects, I suppose, of uh, a certain uh, inclination, of which I would include myself, who, who has a belief, uh, not only a belief, who has a, a sort of tangible experience of architecture as uh, something which provides not just a, a, a point of argument or a point of utility, but actually a fairly fundamental uh, experience. The, the space and form of architecture, the materiality of architecture, uh, the, the inhabitation of architecture actually causes a kind of deep reflection on, on one's own sense of existence and is as sti sticky sweet as the term may be to use that, there's, that there is in fact a certain kind of timeless quality to architecture and that there could be a kind of um, uh, some kind of realm in which one can hit some kind of authentic ground and, and at its most maybe traditional formulation that if one operates within a, with a certain kind of rigor and with a kind of tidy earnestness maybe uh, that one can actually touch on to some sort of qualities that, that transcend the novel and the, and the, the, the immediate. And I think to, to some there, you can, there's other architects who sense this, certainly in the, in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, I, I'm showing Louis Kahn here, of course, in Bangladesh, who I think was, was palpably disturbed by the loss of these sorts of things, the loss of, of uh, a certain kind of coherence of geometry, of materiality, and the, the, the ability of these things to come together and, and slot through his own means uh, of reclaiming them and, and maybe could even produce wonder in a, in a small child. The problem is that, that's when in Philadelphia everyone gasps, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, the problem is that it doesn't matter, the, the, the earnestness that, that uh, Bob speaks about, it's not so much a question of the earnestness itself being wrong, it's that it is out of registration with the, the timber and sensibility of a world that, that long ago had to actually embrace irony as a certain kind of, um, uh, I suppose, a certain kind of strategy for sanity in, in, a, in a world dominated by, by uh, certain kinds of oppressive power structures, etc. cetera, that, that, uh, that there was a reflex to take uh, all well-meaning things. Eventually what became a kind of, what, what started out as a kind of subversive, um, uh, um, means of self-protection, that is irony, uh, eventually became an automatic reflex that, 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 like it or not, casts 
all work of, of, of earnestness into the category of sloppy earnestness. That is to say, it, it mattered, in a sense, the, the, the real tragedy of, of, uh, Louis, uh, of uh, Louis Kahn is that the no amount of, in my view, no amount of talent and sincerity and ability and earnestness that he throws at the project will save it from being uh, uh, comical, I would, I would argue. Strange would be the furthest thing from, from his mind. Uh, and of course, there's another, what, what I, there's another response to this kind of situation, which I call the, the, the uh, uh, I, I, I guess, the new broccoli orthodoxy. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this around here. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this puts forward instead, in, you know, to, to deal with uh, uh, putting aside a lot of the, um, getting around this problem with, with uh, cultural problematics. Uh, and putting forward instead almost a kind of uh, neo-gropius kind of argument that there are tools and the tools are new and if one embraces and sufficiently follows through on the tools that there is, a, that there is an inevitable outcome of that and that will form the architecture and that form of the architecture is, is uh, inherently good and inherently right and there's a, there's a kind of ideological embrace of, uh, of these tools and in the same way that, that uh, you know, it was wrong when Gropius said it and, and uh, uh, in, in its own way, sort of idiotic, in, in the sense that it, it really tried to uh, find uh, a way around the kind of cultural problematics of architecture and assert it as a purely uh, positivistic form. I would say that there's a you know, that there's a limitation of a kind of uh, contemporary ideology as well. So the two things that I'll talk about later is is one the the awkward. Uh, and, and the other, uh, the accident, which, which I suppose in Vienna this would actually fall in the category of the tragic accident. <laughs> but first, uh, but first, a couple of projects. Uh, this first one is, is uh, Mokapi uh, in Shenzhen. This is a competition we did, we lost, I forgot who won it. But, uh, <laughs> I saw a few models like this big of it this afternoon over at Home's office. So that was... Uh, Good exercise. This was actually when I used to write to with, with Parami. So we said about having an architectural practice after we lose all these competitions. He would say, "I'm tired of practice. I'm tired of a practice. I want a firm." <laughs> <laughs> so what, you, this is a. It was an enormous project in the city of Shenzhen. A lot of you may know it. It's just north of Hong Kong. It's a kind of special manufacturing center that was set up even prior to a lot of the, the economic liberalization of China that, that we all know about today. And um, it was, uh, this is a, a, a new center with the civic, civic and cultural center that they're developing in there. Uh, it's, it's a kind of gritty city and very much wants to see itself in competition with uh, places like Beijing and, and Shanghai. And what places like Beijing and Shanghai have, among other things, are big old museums, but they also have these uh, planning exhibition halls. Uh, this is an example of the one, I think this is the one in Beijing, where, where you basically have an enormous model of the entire city into which you insert various kinds of development projects. So it's. It's a kind of World's Fair meets uh, developer underwriting uh, promotional agenda. Uh, on one hand, gigantic model of the city, and then also uh, a new museum of contemporary art. The two together were something uh, above 100,000 square meters in that size. Um, and so we thought of two things. Of course, we thought first of Tatro, the famous <laughs> contortionist that some of you may remember from Pee Wee's uh, Big Top, that movie. Uh, and then Damien Hirst's For the Love of God. Uh, this was Three years ago, I think that piece had just come out. And I, and I thought there was something important about um, the context that, uh, like with the Tatro, that there is, on one hand, there's a kind of uh, bowing that was subservient, and on the other hand, uh, uh, preposterous and aggressive. And that, that combination of being the, the sort of aggressive, aggression while, while being uh, almost a, a bow that goes so far that it inverts itself. Uh, was one part of it, and then of course the, the, the flagrant expense, the flagrant expenditure of money on a project seemed to be the other good part. And so the project, and I'll just show this one briefly, was in fact, uh, uh, it, were this to be built, it's larger than the cantilever that uh, um, uh, Wolf is working on right now in Busan, except the cantilever inverts back on itself, and it's the ingrown cantilever. If you imagine like a horn uh, where the building in the center comes back and passes through itself, without touching. So you have both the contortion and an extraordinary expense paid to uh, create what is a fairly small gap in order to make that, that cantilever. And then it divides itself into uh, basically you have a plaza level where you enter in on, 
The plaza has a structural glass floor. Beneath that glass floor is the gigantic <coughs> model of the city. And then this is the, the, uh, the bent over, be a laser pointer. I guess a big uh, uh, bend that comes around like that, and so the piece hovers above it. The underside of it is painted, but not painted, but it's gilt and gold leaf. And so you have, uh, starting, there's a kind of uh, entrance level there. This is all the planning exhibition hall. This is one below grade where you have the model. The legs themselves become these light-filled uh, atriums that move you up through the top of the building uh, before you move back down through it. So this is the plaza level <coughs> itself, moving that through the museum. You have a, a, a mid-floor, which, which has a uh, kind of elevated urban space, and then through the main halls of the museum. So that's the, the, uh, urban, the urban plaza. Uh, down below, looking up from the model, the interstitial uh, floating urban space of the main hall with these, these strange canted Verandil trusses that, that uh, this is the structural diagram we work with uh, Arab's office in Los Angeles for the project. Bruce Danziger swear he'll sign off on this. Work. There, there you get a sense of the, the cantilever. There's a series of cables in the center, but it's still largely cantilever. So I'm going to start with some relatively recent projects, and then move to a couple of older ones, and then show a couple of uh, other things. Uh, the, the next project, this is another one I'll show just in a little bit of detail, is another competition. Uh, again, one that maybe a, a lot of you know. This was from, I guess, two years ago. Uh, three. This was the uh, uh, an extension to the um, Stockholm City Library, the, the Gunnar Asplund building, the, 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 the very famous Gunnar Asplund building. Uh, a competition ended up having a horrible result. I don't know if any of you followed it. It was one where like people from Stockholm got to vote on projects. It's like <laughs> bad, bad idea. I'm gonna, you know, just I just lost like two more in the last two weeks, and so I thought that's it. Losing one a week. I'm getting out of the competition business. Uh, but this is, I mean, it is fascinating. This is the, of course, the Asplund building and, and uh, well, there, there's other examples. I can't remember the name of the architects of other kinds of this uh, Nordic modernism that make this entire university complex here. These are three of four buildings that are following a site plan of Asplund but are not by him. He had to plan another university building here and that's a, a, a rather, planned a university building here and that's the observatory up on the top. Uh, the entire site is, is oriented towards the north. In, in, uh, uh, in Stockholm is not a, a minor uh, thing to note, or, or roughly north. And, and it was at a strange point where, it was strange in a number of ways. Of course, they, it was, it's an iconic building, and they wanted no way this building to interfere with the iconic presence or usurp the iconic presence of the Asplund building. At the same time, they were building, there's this triangular plaza to, to the left, and they were building a new, um, a kind of regional train station underneath it. There's already a, a you know, kind of a, what do you call it, like an U-Bahn, a, a subway station there. And so from that side, from the triangular side, it was to have some kind of presence, but still not deflect from the other one. Uh, and then that, that hill that has the uh, observatory on it, it was part of this escar, this glacial ridge that used to run through the entire center of uh, Stockholm. You see a little black dot in the middle of it. There's the observatory well, that, before that all got cut back. Um, you see again here, and it kind of fragment. Need to, okay. well, then it got cut down to that, and eventually where the library is, it gets cut with a kind of retaining wall. Uh, so you just have a fragment of that original landscape coming through. Here you see the, the Osplund, that reflecting pond, and you see the original uh, buildings as they were proposed in his site plan. And then interestingly, this was never built, but uh, uh, there was, this was this university building, uh, which has that in plan, but what we got very interested in was that elevation at one point where you see it almost hovering above the other low buildings. There really, it was really a conundrum also because, this was some of our study models, there were these three buildings and they suggested that they were important, but maybe you could remove them. And so it was one of these things where clearly half the jury felt one way, half felt the other, and you had no idea which one it was, so you would have gotten disqualified anyways. And we tried every which way to keep those buildings on there. In the end, it, it, they were not so, I found them not so significant and it didn't make sense one way or the other. So various kinds of strategies of, of infill tight up against that hill where you would keep that building and do a, um, what's that, comb over? Do you, do you know that? When people are 
balding and they grow their hair long on one side and put it over. <laughs> so this is putting the comb over and having the building sort of encase the other ones. And it, what we found, it was really a kind of landscape, it was a kind of urbanism problem as much as it was anything else. And then here where we have the intuition that maybe it ought not to compete with the, the building. The building is about a certain kind of strong form. Uh, a certain kind of iconic series of geometric shapes in that iconic central hall within that drum that I'll show a picture of. So we thought, well, instead of then putting form against form, what we should do is actually think of it as a landscape. Uh, so we put, it's a landscape piece against that, and this is where we tried to recreate the university uh, that was planned up above and have it slide down in various ways. Um, but forward cutting it back so you could see it from the other one. But this was prior to getting rid of the buildings where we realized we, we should actually not design it at all, but actually just look at the series of conditions that are on the site, cut back to those conditions, and then find a way of, of um, materializing it that it doesn't have, um, uh, it, it reads not like the Aspen building. Uh, and so this is something like the final, oh, terrific. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> So just to go through it simply, we, we argued the entire thing in terms of a series of, of uh, 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 in terms of a series of deferential <coughs> moves towards the Asplund. So where you would basically end from the, 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 the ridge of that hill as well. So we pulled back from the hill, pulled back from the front line, uh, pulled back from the Asplund, pulled back from the adjacent building on the other side, uh, created from the new station a view corridor so you could see at least the iconic part of the drum as you went there and then sloped it back so it would meet the hill, uh, and then make a cutout first for an, a kind of a, a truck access alleyway, uh, but also another one that allowed a connection from the street all the way up back to the top of the hill. So in, in what we call our kind of passive aggressive, you could explain all of it as a kind of um, uh, deference to the building, but in fact you end up with something that looks probably more like Mr. Horsepower. <laughs> uh, uh, from. American hot rod culture, so I'm sorry. I'll try not to have too many sort of so culturally specific reference. But, um, uh, so this is the building, and it's, it's, it's done with a, a, a kind of fritted, a frit work of large uh, uh, screens. Uh, but this is the building, and, and what there, you, you see here in terms of its urbanism, that it allows that reading of it, even though it's, it asserts itself in another way as a kind of form. And then what, as I, what I'll show in a minute is a contrast to that drum, the great drum of the, the Aspelon thing, which is a stationary room. What we imagined instead was a piece that would pierce through the entire building and would physically connect the top of the hill with the bottom of the hill on one hand. On the other hand, and this is a, a recreation of a kind of winter sun, it would break that wall that's created along there, so you would actually have light coming all the way deep through and, and illuminate the street. So as you walk by on the street, uh, you actually see this thing sort of sticking out like the cigar from uh, Mr. Horsepower. Uh, see it there. So in contrast to this space, ours is this. It's a it's a structurally woven and independent thing that moves through the the building. Again, these are all the the, just the, the competition work, and that becomes. Like, uh, well, I know at Columbia University, for instance, the Avery Library, the great steps of Kim Mead and White, where everybody hangs out there, and that becomes a kind of social space of itself. This is, this is the, the main reading room is intended as a kind of giant staircase that you would move through. So instead of the, the static space, it's a kind of moving space. It's a view of the thing. And so this thing moves, just to show you from the, the lowest level, uh, it moves its way up and through the building. You, you actually, and I'll show you another project later, you don't actually enter into it. You can look through it, but you enter in, go into the, uh, the entry hall, and then from that entry hall, you go back up inside of it to then continue moving up. And then where it pierces the glass on the top of the hill, there's a kind of outdoor space. Um, the next losing competition I'd like to show is for uh, Poland. Uh, in Warsaw, the, the uh, uh, Museum of Polish History. Anyone here lose that one? Uh, but interesting, and in, and in doing so, I'll talk. I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an, as an excuse to go into some discussion of the uh, uh, the awkward. Uh, a couple of things, and it's actually I had an interesting conversation with uh, some of the uh, postgraduate students uh, uh, this morning and this afternoon, and, and this project might touch on a couple of things. 
Uh, there was an existing building, which is this castle that was ruined in the Second World War, torn down in the, in the 50s and then rebuilt in the 70s from scratch, so it's very funny. And this sort of art center here, and this is the building itself. I'll show you the urban, the urban part of it as a second, as a second thing. Uh, but the main idea is this, uh, something we've been working on for a while, going back first off to the Octoruno projects and, and some of the work when we were working with Jeff and when he was a kind of virus between our office uh, and Peter Eisenman's office, there was the work on the sectional object. Uh, which I, we could talk through that and, and were some of the, the, uh, um, the various strands of, of uh, that particular uh, architectural interest and, uh, and obsession come from. But, uh, this is some work that I've been doing and working on with some studios at, at SciArc as well that try to bring a different, uh, I, I suppose, a different both uh, a different sensibility, both of figuration and more importantly, a different topological condition into the problem of the sectional object, which is which is basically doing a sort of Russian nesting doll, but where the things nesting don't match each other. So you have the differentiation of the inner and the outer object, creating importantly. Uh, sectional space, which is that peripheral space between the and outside uh, external and ex uh, enclosure and an internal uh, uh, object, uh, and, and it is a way of, in that sectional space of, among other things, neutralizing a certain clarity of objectness, I suppose, with a project. But the problem with, like the Russian nesting doll, you may create these unusual sectional conditions where the reading of the object is unclear, but of course then there's always another enclosure outside of that and another enclosure outside of that. So it's the idea of the involution is to look at certain uh, um, uh, topological things, so I guess we would call it the, uh, the near Klein bottle, whereby, um, this is a, a, a fast company, you know, the, the hip hop. Uh, brand that's their logo, but I thought this was great because this is exactly what we were trying to do in this project, which is that you have an external form, and then at some point, the uh, external form pierces its own skin and comes to the inside, and it becomes its own object. It's and, and that object has a certain kind of figuration. And then these eyeballs are all the people, so you can be in the sectional space, but at least at, at, at some topological level, there's a continuity of surface where that surface continues in to become the inside. So there's a, there's a moment at which it avoids the, the nesting doll. So you know the, the, the ship inside of the bottle? At some point you have the ship inside of the bottle, then in a different section, the ship itself becomes the bottle. Um, and, and here you see the, the main hall, which has these uh, uh, pendulous uh, um, auditorii inside of it. Here, where the building turns in on itself, and then the second uh, portion there which has to do with the circulation coming through. So this is that first one where you enter in the main hall and these, these are these uh, large volumes that are hanging inside of it here and then the second one where the building wraps around again and comes inside of itself there. You can see it. Um, and then in the, the exterior skin is, a, is an expression of that as, as well. Um, just to switch to the urbanism for a minute, um, you see here this, this is actually a freeway, and this is a sort of bridge over the freeway. And, and this gets into, I guess, a, a discussion of the awkward relative to urbanism. Um, this is a 19th century plan of uh, this portion of Warsaw. Uh, and in particular, I'll show these. There's, a, there's this ridge here that runs along the, 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 uh, the Vistula River is right along here, and this is the ridge that defines the entire edge of the old section of the city. Up to the north here is, is the, uh, the historic center, and always dotted along here, there were a series of uh, villas and other important buildings and palaces, right? And then you can see the, the, the extensive Baroque planning that took place there, which the competition was very much interested in, in reconstructing. Just for reference, that building that I told you they rebuilt in the 1970s is here. The rest of it's gone. Uh, so then, what happened is, and this is this is sort of a certain kind of history of, of urbanism over over 150 or 200 years, is uh, there this freeway gets built, and so there's the original axis I was showing, the one that would tie the site, you know, that tie the site directly to this uh, larger urbanism, to this other kinds of uh, rural planning there. 
uh, and then this gets put in, right? So it literally crosses across the axis, destroys the axis, the visual continuity of the entire thing, which on one hand is seen as a kind of um, crime against the Baroque urbanism, on the other hand, ties whether through design or, or by, um, the, the, I suppose, the violence of traffic engineering also defines a lot of 20th century uh, urbanism. So uh, this is that road coming through, and what you were asked to do is build over this and construct right on top of that road. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking of three ways of, uh, three ways of, of inhabiting a city, because we know the first and the second are already represented on the site. This is um, Gustav Kalibot's um, painting of, of a Parisian street, uh, where this is the, the, uh, the flaneur, the, the stroller through the city street, the paramutations through the city actually the, the movement of the body through the city and the geometry of the city reinforced one another. And you got your sense of propriety from that geometry and you could bestow that then upon the city. I, I suppose in terms, of, in terms of planning at its grandest scale, you can see that in, in Versailles. Uh, the second line, the red line, of course, is, 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 goes counter to that planning of the city. And of course, this was done by Polish traffic engineers. Uh, but we can see that, you know, this is the, the uh, the so-called the, the tracers that practice the art of parkour. Can any of you do that? Parkour is here. Really good in Vienna? Is that just Parisian housing plot, uh, housing projects? Uh, so here, you know, they're, 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 you, you, you all know what that is, right? Those guys who jump around on top of it. And, you know, and this is a great example of a housing project in Paris where you actually see, this is the sort of, if the first one is, is, is classical or Baroque, this would be the, the uh, deconstruction, right? where you actually cut a line across the intended order of the city in order to uh, practice a different art, but more importantly, in order to reveal the, the, the oppression inherent in that existing order, right? It's a great thing, you know, they want us, the housing project wants us to walk this way, we've invented an entire art that goes exactly across it. That, of course, has its, 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 uh, its history in the 20th century as well, not just in the hands of Polish traffic engineers, but in terms of, of uh, architects that we know and love, like Bernard Schumi at, at um, uh, La Villette. And we mentioned something else, again, bringing in a kind of topological condition, which is of the, the chain link fence, as a way of both doing neither a support of the existing structure, and, and this is really just to get at a diagram, well, neither in, in, in pure support and reinforcement of an existing uh, urban diagram, nor its, uh, critic, nor its critical, um, um, uh, undoing, I suppose, uh, but actually allowing both to happen. And you know, looking at things like uh, Olmsted's uh, uh, Central Park, that you know, a lot of you no doubt know, you can move from one side of the city, one side of the park to the other, without even realizing that there's all of these uh, fairly large roads that cut through it simply by uh, uh, separating the, the the grade. Not unlike this. Except in ours, we take it to a different kind of uh, knot. If the other one was a near Klein bottle, this is a, a near Mobius strip. Uh, and, and you see it here. What we have is uh, through this ability of paths to pass each other without actually connecting. Uh, see a little kind of pierced landscape Mobius. Uh, here's a kind of a, a study model of one of those conditions. Um, it, those would be paths that you move through. So, because what you have is you have this is that that road we talked about before. Here's that ridge. Uh, here's the museum. This is a, a new building proposed. So this this entire area here. Uh, what you have is following these lines. You do in fact actually reconstruct that original axis, and then following the kind of uh, cusps of the line, you construct another axis to the. In itself, but you can't actually take either of them directly there. Uh, so it is like if you think of a, 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 a it's somewhere be working with certain laws of perspective, and I suppose the British haha. -ha. You still study things like haha. -ha. <laughs> you do. Oh, good. So that you, you can see a certain kind of continuity, but it, it's only it's only apparent. And so you know you see this going towards that, and you see another series of cusps, uh, but in fact they all they all pass by each other. Uh, and then the only way you get through them, this is from Detroit where you have lots of empty property, you get the so-called desire line where people just walk across the landscape to get wherever they want. So the roads do one thing, you do something else. They're not 
across each other like this. They're not in line with each other. So, so my, 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 uh, uh, so this is the, these are all Paris. One is the Paris on the boulevard. Uh, the second one, the Paris of the housing project. And this is, uh, 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 what is the name? Uh, Pierre Antoine Dussoule, who uh, is, is very interesting. I, I uh, had to secure rights from him because I use this, this uh, photograph and this essay. I just finished. So we somehow found this guy. It was like a random Google search, but I found him and contacted him. He wanted like a lot of money to use this. this I think like five hundred dollars. I thought we can't. You know, it's an academic journal. And he writes back and he goes, "Yes, uh, my colleagues in the U.S. have you know know of your work and you understand you're a very serious architect." And so I thought this is great. I actually have credibility among the the contortionist community. You know, it's already. <laughs> So do you ask him to use it? Fantastic. Um, so to, we'll go back to, to uh, uh, Clifford Jerry. Uh, so but we'll go back to this for a second. So what this means is, so if, if one is the stroller and the grain, the other then this one is actually wrong. So this was, you know, the idea of the awkward is to actually do something that's fundamentally out of place and something that's fundamentally wrong. He is on the stairs. The feet are touching the stairs, yet clearly he's not going to go anywhere with conventional walking. And so this suggests that one needs to, in fact, reconsider, you know, that, that, that somehow he's, he's not, um, in, he's, 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 he's merely partially out of sync with the city. And, and that to me is, is uh, getting to the, the notion of the, um, uh, the awkward. We were talking this afternoon that I thought it went back even to uh, I mean, a kind of punk sensibility as opposed to, to um, New Wave, um, of course, being from Detroit, I have to show Iggy Pop at least uh, once. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, so, so the notion that one has to, oh, is that the timer? I guess it was. Um, let's see. Oh, we'll go to this. Uh, so it's just looking around and understanding that at least it's in some sort of a, a punk sensibility, but, but increasingly so, that there is a certain kind of, uh, that, and again, this is, Maybe it curbed your enthusiasm. It probably doesn't translate. Or Ricky Gervais. I go past this. Uh, cringe comedy is a, is a, is a popular form of comedy. Um, the the uh, comedy that makes you extremely uncomfortable, which is, you know, so this is another sort of indication of this. It's like, at, at some point, I always think like humor, you find something funny before you can really explain why, like new kinds of humor actually appear. And so suddenly, this is certainly in the US and, and, and England. Uh, things that are actually painful to watch, like you're not sure if you should watch it because such horrible situations happen. Not horrible in terms of violence or anything like that, but horrible in terms of their inevitable, catastrophic social um, um, inappropriateness. And like uh, uh, Larry David of Curb Your Enthusiasm is very famous for this. There was an article in the New Yorker magazine that was uh, talking about a group of schizophrenics that are, are just, they, they, they couldn't watch TV because they just didn't understand it, except, you know, some of this humor. Like, they could watch this, like, highly embarrassing and awkward humor, and they understood, actually, they didn't find it strange at all. So, uh, so, so whatever that says. But to go back to uh, another uh, uh, tidy or earnest uh, architect, of course, is uh, uh, Peter Zinthorpe. I, I'm, showing, so I'm showing two different works here uh, to get to this idea of the, the awkward, um, and, and it has to do with I guess understanding, in another level, understanding the limits of expertise. Uh, and so this goes back to the, the Louis Kahn, that one has to, one gets to a point where mastery, when mastery itself becomes suspect, you can basically do one of, I think, three things. And, and I think we are in a situation where mastery itself, at least certainly in the form that someone like Zumthor and, and, and probably many others practice it, uh, would, would take the right to it. Uh, one idea is that one can simply ignore irony and think that that's trivial and, and, and a trivial thing to stand in the way of actual serious architecture and continue throwing all of one's talent and sincerity and, and technical ability at architecture as if that problem didn't exist and I would say that that's uh, uh, Peter Zumthor. Uh, the second one is uh, what I call um, uh, easy expertise, which maybe is best exemplified certainly earlier on by Rem Koolhaas in a kind of Dutch school 
which says that any time you actually get, if, you, if you're so good at architecture, then you're simply fetishizing it and you're looking at the wrong thing, that architecture ought not to be so, uh, so it ought not to be about mastery, uh, but instead about other things. And, and that, in fact, had a certain degree of success, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, but at a, at a certain point, uh, whether it's traditional or not, expertise and mastery, the lack of expertise and mastery itself will inevitably lead to a kind of ceiling of where, what one can achieve in architecture. And so what you see is, uh, among other uh, examples, and of course this is the Japanese, on the right is the Japanese photographer, Sujimoto. It's not, it's not Zumthor, it's a photograph of Zumthor for by Hiroshi Tsujimoto. It's from his famous architecture series. And, and the series, I don't know if any of you have seen it, Tsujimoto is, is um, a fascinating artist who works through photography, does what are probably some of the most technically spectacular and perfect photographs that you'll find. Uh, and here he does a, a series of photographs of iconic buildings. All of them are precisely out of focus. And that's the error that the first, you know, the beginner, uh, you know, my mother would make that before they had automatic, you know, focus on their cameras, right? It's the, it's the worst error of an amateur. Uh, so this is actually the, a case of expertise, uh, intentionally diverting expertise into error in order to break out of, break out of traditional sensibilities and, and go into new ones. Uh, Thomas Roof from his famous JPEG series. If any of you have ever seen any of these photographs, they're, you know, about the size that I'm projecting it there, and they're, you know, cost about a gazillion dollars. And, and uh, they're, they're all made from uh, uh, highly compressed found images where the, manipulated further, but where the quilting artifact itself, which is the thing that, you know, I would always cringe at when that would be produced in, a, in an overly compressed photograph. Uh, here it actually becomes a sensibility, and so you suddenly end up with a, I'm going to speak more into the mic. Is it, can you not hear me? I usually speak loud and just have... We're also asking you Okay, thanks. I can, I can. I usually think I'm too loud. Uh, so you suddenly have this amazing second space, which is this reticulated grain of the surface itself, in addition to the um, uh, still legibility of the image. So here's my diagram for it. This is one of I have a few diagrams. Uh, so he, this was this is what we would this is what everyone would like to imagine. This is traditional classical model. Here's the beginner. Here's the expert. Here's bad architecture. Here's good architecture. Right? <laughs> And somewhere here is per perfect. That's the perfect architecture. <laughs> did, I, did I point this at the wrong thing? So, so of course, this is what we think. This is what we think that if you go as you as you climb up the long ladder of expertise, that uh, the work gets better and better, uh, and that although you know, as with many things, like with uh, high fidelity equipment, you know, here you have to double your amount of expertise to only make a very small increment towards perfection, but we, you know, we can understand this diagram, right? Uh, and then this is in fact the problem, is that at some point, regardless of how much one may struggle with, with uh, earnestness, sloppy or, or otherwise, uh, that if one doesn't deal with that uh, force field, that barrier that one never gets past a certain point in architecture. And so easy expertise was just simply saying you don't need so much expertise, you just have to not go at it asymptotically, you need to go at it straight and you can actually pierce that, that atmosphere and get, get past it. Which is true, and I think to some degree you can, but then there's some kind of limit that's hit there because of the lack of mastery. <laughs> that's where I put a lot of the Dutch school. So, so the awkward <laughs> has, uh, I, I believe, so this is the idea of the Sujimoto or the, the Rufero, it has the ability to uh, go, it, it, it has a different angle to approach that problem, and I think it can go through it, a kind of Trojan horse for what Jeff might call the new authenticity. Um, certainly, I think, it, uh, probably more recent cool house projects, I think certainly in the work of uh, Herzog and Demeron, uh, although it's probably not articulated in this way, you see this kind of, uh, you see this kind of strategy where certainly no one doubts the uh, expertise of their, of their architecture, uh, but yet they're able to get past a kind of, uh, you know the hair, the hair shirt monks used to wear? That Zoom Thor sort of itchiness of the hair shirt, they seem to are, are able to, to bypass that. Did I just it So here, here's the problem. I tried to do an awkward studio at Sci Art, 
But when you're teaching students, you know, they're like here, right? So if you're teaching traditional authenticity, you get pretty good projects. When you're teaching offward, you know, until the student, <laughs> it's not a good student. It's not a good student project. You really end up with. So for those of you in, in or non studio, it's a it's a the third wire, it's the third rail there. It's a dangerous uh, territory. Uh, so it's funny, you know. It's it's um, you know some people say about art. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I know when I see it. I think with the awkward, it's uh, I don't know what it is, but I know when I feel it. <laughs> and finally. <laughs> it's, a, it's not itchy, what's the feeling? I don't know. Uh, and then this is, uh, uh, cuspoidal forms, I'm going to argue, is, is, a, is a certain off-putting form. This is a project we just lost last week. I'm only going to show a couple of images. It was for a reskinning of an existing building in Seoul for a, a museum of contemporary history, uh, a, a series of new formal, a new direction of formal study for us, but I'll just show this briefly. The, uh, the, the second thing, which is the accident, and I'm going to show some pictures and then I'll, I'll, I'll show a project. Um, this also came up this afternoon in, in uh, uh, Hernan's studio. Um, the, the, uh, the, my, I guess my interest in it, um, well, I'm going to show a bunch of slides, so I'll talk about my interest uh, and where they came about as I'm showing the slides, because they'll go through quickly. I mean, there's, there's a lot of them. But let me just say that it, it, it probably originated with uh, Paul Virilio's exhibition at the Cartier Foundation from maybe six or seven years ago called Unknown Quantity. If you, haven't, if you didn't see the show, maybe you've seen the book. It's, it's very interesting. And the entire discourse about the accident, in particular the technological accident as a, as a contemporary, uh, inevitable contemporary question that pushes itself more and more into our consciousness. And if you think about uh, things in the news, everything from, uh, and, it, and it's uh, the, the accident may be natural, but there's technological consequences of it, or the accident itself is technological. So whether it's a, a volcano interrupting 180,000 flights or so, you understand, or or whether it's the worst uh, oil spill in the history of man that's uh, unfolding right now in the in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, we understand that this is you know you can you can connect the dots and understand it, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I got interested in seeing the show was not so much, I suppose, the theory of it and the reality of it, which is something that one has to be quite conscious of, uh, but more particularly, I saw in the same way as with the, the awkward, that there was a possibility of a different kind of formal sensibility that was emerging. And, and, and looking, as we started looking through the accident in some depth, uh, I realized there's also a kind of formal history of the accident, that at some point in uh, our technology, we were taking rock and dressing it to make stone to put into a, a, a building, and then when when uh, an accident would happen, dressed stone would, would return to feral rock again. Uh, and that this actually became not only the, was this at one point um, the, the, the main thrust of our idea of a technological accident, but it, it too got absorbed into a kind of sensibility. Uh, uh, Hubert Robert and his paintings of the Louvre as a ruin, for instance, or certainly Piranesi's work were the idea of that kind of becoming feral again of the dressed rock was a, was a certain kind of sensibility. Uh, and then the interesting thing is when you start looking at uh, steel and iron, uh, that uh, at first people actually didn't have the, the aesthetic sensibility in order to depict it. And you would find, I mean, this is a particularly uh, fanciful uh, depiction of a bridge collapse in Scotland from, from a newspaper. Uh, but it, often they had no more reality than the kind of uh, uh, early European depictions of, uh, on, on the right, a crocodile hunt in Florida, I decried. Uh, and then, you know, into the 20th century, materials changed, sensibilities changed. This, of course, is the iconic Montparnasse uh, traffic accident. Uh, Ed Eigen gives an entire lecture on this. Uh, in, you know, I would think uh, looking at the work of deconstruction has more than a little bit of a relationship to this kind of sensibility. Uh, and then you start finding other things, the twisting and, and uh, Distorting the, the spill. We talked about this in, in the studio this afternoon. This is the, the great uh, Boston molasses spill of 1909. For those of you who know what molasses is, it's a 
dark, sticky, sweet liquid, very thick liquid, and they had like a 13-gallon tank of it that exploded one January morning, killing dozens of people, burying them under the sticky stuff. Uh, horses died. You know, and everything was terrible, terrible. They still, they say in that part of Boston on a hot summer day, you can still smell it. Uh, but this whole idea was then suddenly you have a certain amount of an ingredient that is not natural and a technological envelope that's able to hold together large quantities of it and so you have a rupture of that envelope. And so the, the form of this actually then became new and, and, and going back to this which has as much to do with the mass production of consumer goods, the speed of vehicles, the arrangement and, and, uh, uh, of shipping and shipping networks and, and the surfaces of the tarmac. Uh, that produces its own kind of geometry. Um, and then increasingly I would say that one thing that we find is it becomes more and more uh, atmospheric and dispersed. So it's less and less about um, shards and pieces uh, and more and more about kind of atmospheres. This is actually fake. This is Hollywood from the road, um, the, the movie that came out last year. Uh, but they did a pretty good job of desolation. Uh, uh, wildfires in Southern California, the oil fires in Kuwait, uh, the entire power outage on the east coast of the United States, the big blackout from um, 2004, I think, or three. Uh, and so what, what we did, and I'll, I'll just show this and I'll say a few things. Each image is just a second, but there's a couple hundred of them. Uh, we started to think through what actually the form of the accident is. And, and um, you know, what, what Virilio writes about, and I, I won't even try to paraphrase him, but, but um, the discussion is that uh, the technological arrangement, the willful manipulation of matter uh, through technology into our utile arrangements that we, whether it's an airplane, a building, a, a, a network, a communications network, that it always has, always embedded within it, its own undoing. That uh, wittingly or not, uh, the designer of the automobile is also the designer of the automobile accident. This is not something that a designer wishes, nor is it something that a designer would ever know exactly how it would happen or what form it happens. But the thing we start realizing as our technological uh, uh, accomplishments become greater and more dispersed is that it is the inevitable counterpoint, that you can't think of one without the other, and one can seek one and vilify the second, but vilified or not, more properly, it is about a kind of reciprocity between one and the other. Um, so that's a very interesting area to be, uh, uh, to be working in, I thought, uh, because it, it, it puts two things together, whether we're talking in terms of aesthetics or whether we're talking about uh, urbanism as we were discussing this morning. It's that point where precise instrumental top-down control, I will take you raw material and form you into the airplane, form you into the building skin, uh, meets the bottom-up inevitability of, let's say, matter behaving badly. Uh, that, that it has its own logics, it has its own, its own way of assembling and disassembling itself, and by hook or by crook, eventually it will make itself, it will make itself felt. Uh, and so, as, as terrible as, of course, the, the, the tragedy that, that many of these show, uh, and, and this is not something to, to dwell on a kind of morbid fascination with this, although you can if you want. Uh, but, but rather just thinking that this, what an amazing, it is this that point where uh, actually one can neither discuss this as the top-down arrangement that most of these assemblies are, nor a, a, a spontaneous bottom-up configuration, but it's actually that sensibility of where the two things um, uh, overlap. I may run out of things to say about the accident before the images end, but this is a, Whale explosions in Taiwan. It turns out there's an entire genre of whale explosions. Uh, there's another one that I'm not showing here, which is of, uh, it's more for the, where the awkward meets the accident. There's uh, um, fashion models on the runway, photographs taken of them when they trip and are just about to fall. It's fascinating. I have a student that's collected like 30 or 40 of those images. Uh, yeah, exactly where the awkward and the accident meet. I'll just let it run out to another minute or so.
when I was showing this at Princeton, I was the only architect. There were mostly uh, scholars uh, presenting, and uh, including one who's a professor at Princeton in uh, the history of science. And he's telling me like the date of all of these uh, explosions. And the, the last Russian nuclear bomb test that was done on. It, for me, it was a, 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 a uh, essay in uh, Google. So here's my diagram. So if you have, uh, and, and this is, I mean, and, and it's a more general one, that if you have here uh, two fictions, one of the, the pure artifice, that thing that is, that is purely the, the, uh, the technological object itself, and then the other thing, maybe not such a fiction, which is pure nature, that is to say, the, a thing that is, that is just, um, a natural sort of bottom-up current, I suppose, a tree, let's say, at the other end. Um, that, uh, you know, you can see within architecture two tendencies, at, as we traditionally think of and practice architecture, which is to say that, uh, uh, so the top one is, this is a, to what extent a geometry is imposed on matter, and to what extent matter itself would, would self-organize. And this is sort of traditional, and maybe there's a sensibility now that among some parties that would argue that uh, that architecture, at least in its formal principles, ought to be um, at the latter. But, but I'm going to argue that there's, there's a couple of things. Um, first off, at the end of the, at, at the, at the end of, so if you think of a, on the left, the Albert Durer melancholia, right, the, the geometrician deciding the, the form of that polyhedron and taking mute natural rock and, and composing it to its will. And on the other hand, the hornets that come together to form their, their, fascinating, uh, their fascinating nest. Um, and th I guess the point that I wanted to make was, first off, looking at the, uh, the hornet's nest, uh, within architecture, our interest is not so much the side of it that's on the right, but actually after the artifice of the section cut is made through it and, and the structure of it is, is revealed. So on one hand, that idea of pure artifice never actually has traction. And then on the other hand, that within the, the dressed stone, that there's no degree of perfection that ever overcomes the particularities of that particular piece of matter. Right? There's this saying, at least in the US, no two snowflakes are alike, but of course we understand that no two anything are alike, at least at some level, uh, crystalline, molecular level, no two anything are alike. And so there, there is a fiction that instead of it being uh, um, architecture as a material practice, we don't operate at either of those two extremes, that we have, you know, whatever, whatever end of the spectrum one imagines us working in, it's, it's somewhat pulled in from that. And then in fact, just like a car crash, where those two things meet is exactly where, you know, I would argue the, you know, that, again, speaking through a kind of hunch that maybe that there is a kind of territory or sensibility there where the, the strange uh, and, and complex possibilities of analog, unpredictable analog reaction uh, and the determined, the determined uh, um, arrangements of technology meet. Uh, so to, uh, one brief project that we did as a kind of test for it and, and thought we would just lose a competition while we were at it. This is for uh, the main pavilion for the uh, Yosu 2014 Expo. Uh, Yosu is in, in the south of Korea. Uh, this was a project, I just pulled this out as a study. This was something I'd done um, several years ago, uh, doing some exhibits for this uh, uh, science museum in, in Detroit. But the whole thing was this thing that moved on all of these little sticks, and it would dance around on the floor, and you could crawl inside of it. Uh, but we, we decided the, uh, the expo was on the water. It's on the coast. Uh, the whole theme of it had to do with the ocean, what is the future of the ocean for mankind because these expos always have these strange overarching themes. And, and um, so they, they, had a, they had this theme. Uh, they wanted to see man's relationship to the ocean, ways in which it depends on it, and they can also mitigate certain conditions to the ocean. So we thought, well, this would be uh, interesting if you imagine that. They say, and they also, the other thing that they always say for these things is, we want you to build a pavilion, but we don't want to have to just have it have a temporary use. We would like it to be a permanent building afterwards. And there's a long history of expos where they say that and it never actually happens, whether it's Buckminster Fuller's Dome or the building they just finished in, in um, 
Uh, I try to do this as a, you know, in a, in a foreign thing because the U.S. does such a pitiful job of their pavilions these days. I think we used to have those Buckminster Fuller domes. Um, so what we imagined was something else, and we worked with a, a, uh, uh, a biologist as well as a structural engineer on this project. Uh, so this is off the, off, just off the coast, you approach it with a walkway, so it's out in the harbor. And so uh, imagined a scenario whereby there is, uh, again, this is with Bruce Danziger of, of Arab, where there is a, a, a ratchet mechanism, the, the entire pavilion into the water, and I'll show you the images of it, but basically the, the entire ceiling moves and racks and goes back and forth uh, as the thing descends into the water. And then somewhere uh, at the end of the uh, expo, it's, it's down considerably more than that, and these things have been. Uh, then after that, it continues to have a useful life until the roof is simply too low. Uh, the roof and floor planes and mechanical equipment and fabric are removed. Uh, you make uh, Korean freight tag bags out of them. And then uh, eventually it continues to sink. And then what this is, it turns out Korea spends several billion dollars a year on the construction of artificial reefs. And so by, by introducing an electrical charge into this reef, you accelerate the growth, and it, it becomes an off the coast, a new artificial reef. So in fact, it will have a life for a couple of thousand years afterwards. It just switches from a building uh, to a reef. Um, so some of the, the mechanisms for lowering the, the eight columns, uh, the building itself with the columns starting to camp. Uh, this is at sort of, uh, sort of middle of the expo. And then a kind of perspective sequence from the competition. And the thought is that one could structure it, yet not know exactly how it ends up. Right? That's the, and then at some point it's stripped of its, uh, it's stripped of its skin, st still you know, reaching, uh, 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 reeling and lurching uh, for several more years uh, until finally it becomes a tourist attraction and a reef under them. Uh, just briefly a shorter project uh, that I, this would be another discussion, but this is a uh, house that it should be under construction soon in northern Michigan, you know, we're in the lakes, this is on Lake Huron, uh, so this is north is up, so this is facing east, uh, and uh, just a, there's the site, it's, it's only interesting, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively flat site, there is a bluff, uh, here, which is the old shoreline of, of Lake Huron that rises 200 feet. Is that uh, 80, not 80 meters? 30, 30, 200, 70 meters. 60 or 70 meters, yeah, that rises. Not that tall, but you can see it. But there's very tall trees here, and there's a ra raised railroad bed, and there's a freight train that goes two times every day up and down, and it's, it's about maybe uh, uh, two meters higher than the ground. The rest is all, is all wetland, and there's just a small... <laughs> built area, infilled area where we would build on. Uh, and the idea was, and, and all these very tall trees, and the idea was to build this house that would go uh, kind of up into the trees. Some really sketches. Uh, and working with um, a series of things, what I'll talk about last is, uh, the last set of diagrams has to do with, uh, I guess, um, uh, uh, Kristen mentioned the, the autonomous works. I would call them quasi-autonomous things that have a, uh, a certain kind of coherent life by themselves, independent of a, of a particular project, but eventually tether back into a project. And this very much grew out of a series of drawings that I'd done when I was in Rome and on some earlier projects, uh, which had to do with certain kinds of projections, I suppose. Uh, and and a, con a confounding between, say, projection as it appears on a drawing and projection as one might experience it in space. And I guess if you looked at the, some of the late sculptures of Tony Smith, for instance, any of those. They're, they have an uncanny quality of you can be in the same room with them and yet they seem to be following a different laws of physics than you yourself are. And, and uh, so, so there was a, a series of, of forms that were worked out from that, uh, a progression of, of sort of up, down, across, and then a, a, a mixing of these things in order to, to let us get very tall with the building. I'm sorry, I should have done the conversion. It's 40 feet tall, that's uh, 12 meters, 40 feet. 12 meters about, yeah, it's about 12 meters tall. Oh. It kind of fits into a half cube turned on its side. Uh, it's like six meters by 12 meters, something like that. A very small house, but goes up. Uh, but these, you can see the studies with all of those various pieces as they project into one another. Um,
the, the, it was in an expensive house. It is made with um, just tube steel with, with channel steel holding out all of the cantilevers. It's a kind of modified monocoque. Um, uh, there's a series of, I don't know what you call them, and I, I know they're quite common in Europe, uh, they call them SIPS panels, structural integrated panels. F foam with two pieces of particle board glued on either side, a giant piece of foam core that's just cut with a, a saw, a laser, you know, like a, a, a CNC saw that cuts out these enormous panels and you bolt them onto the buildings of the building. Because there's very unstable foundations there, we have deep piles and then these columns that come up and these things uh, uh, brace onto it. Uh, but you can still see that sense of these spaces that have projected past each other. And you, you move up very quickly from <laughs> the ground floor, which has a performance space for the, the wife who's a cellist, up to a, a kind of living space. Once you're in the living space, you're higher than the train track, and you can also look over the low trees out to the lake. And then you keep moving up, and eventually there's a kind of master suite, and at that point, and all, all the way up to the roof, at that point you can see back over the tall trees all the way to the bluff. The last diagrams. Um, how am I doing in time? Okay. Okay, good. Um, I guess uh, in, in talking about sort of Axe Runo, we were talking about drawings this afternoon, and, and uh, uh, I think at some point I asked someone, we, we pulled up the uh, uh, Micro Megas, Daniel. It's funny. Daniel Liebeskin had a whole other life before he was a famous architect. It's <laughs> quite important, actually. Um, uh, uh, I'm not going to go so far as to say more interesting, but I think more important work than, than the work that's going on now. Uh, but it, there was a, a, uh, a moment where um, uh, architectural drawings by, certainly by the uh, mid-70s or late 70s, uh, by the early 80s also, had lost a lot of their, uh, I, I guess this, the story is over. I won't go through the whole thing I went over with you guys this afternoon, that's too, that's too lengthy, but uh, suffice it to say that as architects, we understand that we're out of a tradition where uh, we don't go and build buildings. Uh, we don't build them, we don't pay for them. What we do is we draw them, and then those serve as a series of directions, of course, for others to build them. Uh, obvious enough, and there's exceptions to that, but we still understand that the main thrust of the profession, the tradition that we come out of, is that. Um, and there's lots of things that architects might do in the production of building, but obviously drawings have been the, the kind of line share, the, the, the center of that. Um, the, the, uh, I suppose the interesting part to think about, that I always think about, uh, is that if you are, say, a painter, and uh, you're working on a particular work, you don't have that problem of mediation. In other words, you, and I know there's lots of alternative art practices, but let's make a kind of simple diagram. You have a canvas, you have your paint, you daub the paint onto the canvas. That is not an instruction for then that artwork to be made. It is actually the artwork itself. So the experience of working on it is working on the thing itself, and there is that direct mediated experience. It's a material practice, uh, not only in the sense that it has you know material presence, but that the working in the working space of it is a material uh, experience. Um, architecture is odd that way. You you draw a line, and that line is to indicate where a wall is going to get built. Uh, the strange thing about it is that looking at it that way or not, it exists also simply as a line. That that there is a kind of imminence. There is a reality of that that it exists the way a line exists on paper. And, and, and I would argue that that's always, I think, been inherent in the production of architecture itself. In other words, that there's a working space that mediates always between the imminent, that is that thing that is just sitting there, right? A model is also something you can weigh. It's not just a, a model of something that's going to be built in the future. And it's also projected. And I think that that's absolutely intrinsic to the, the, the basic idea of what architecture uh, not what architecture is, but what the practice of architecture itself is, that, that we operate within that space. And what we were discussing was the point that uh, 
probably earlier in the tradition of architect as separate profession, as he who draws and does not build, right, or, or she, but of course when it was founded, um, not so much she, uh, that that, that, that um, uh, the role of drawing, its imminence, was never so much spoken about, but I think was, uh, it, it was not raised to the consciousness as a problematic, right? So you can go look at Borromini's drawings, you can go look at a lot of drawings of significant works of architecture, and there are drawings which are absolutely fascinating in and of themselves. Not just to give you insights into the building, but actually completely separate from that, the logic, the, the sensibility of them is palpable. Um, now, that was lost, I, I think, at different times, certainly within the, the main thrust of the profession by the time we get into late modernism, or the, at some point too late modernism, uh, e even beyond that. And so I think there was a certain recovery almost with the vengeance, not only of, of uh, someone like Liebeskin, but at least in the earlier work of John Haydick and, and maybe some things called the Rossi and others, uh, a, a, reinvent, uh, a, a, a reinvestment into that lost space uh, and, and saying that architecture actually needs that, uh, that that is not only uh, an important arena for the construction of architecture, but that the nature of the drawing itself had, most importantly, not to describe a picture of architecture, right? That's when you're done. But when you're working on it, it is actually the space that the architecture is going to exist in. And so I think that idea of architectural drawing as the determination of space, uh, as opposed to the depiction of something in a pre-given space, is, is a fairly fundamental quality, certainly after drawings were raised to the foreground as a kind of problematic. And, and the, 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 the uh, criticism that I was uh, talking today about, it's not a criticism, it's a, it's a difficulty with digital environments, is if you were to look at the space of drawing, right? if you think of it in terms of the history of art, but also within architecture. Uh, perspective is at this point, what, 450 years old, 500 years old? I don't know, when, 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 when did Alberti sit around and do those things? Uh, it's an ex it was two things that are important to understand. When it was done, it was absolutely radical and non-intuitive, right? It's not about the way you and I see, but it was a, it was a kind of radical prop, uh, 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 proposition. Uh, and and um, number two, it was fundamentally about constructing a new space. It wasn't about almost less what a building looks like, or it was, you know, it's not about what you put into that perspective space. It was the fact that you could actually rationalize space. That is, you gave it ratio, and you could describe things with a certain ratio. Are there proving that the arts were part of this, you know, as, as, as noble as the sciences? Uh, this is sort of uh, groundbreaking stuff. By this point, of course, it's what every camera does. It's what, you know, we, we've, it's gone so far that we actually think it's natural. So, so I would argue it's an extremely uh, reactionary and retrogressive space, and that the space that an architect works in has a strong influence on the nature of what one does. And so the thing that's, I think, one thing that is, is absolutely fantastic is, a, is sort of um, uh, the digital potential of architecture provides is coming to terms with the fact that the working space itself is often in perspective. And, and I think that uh, it, it it shows in certain unquestioned presumptions about, uh, about architecture. It, it, it's, it's very good at determining uh, what an object is like. In any case, I wanted to uh, just show this. So if you have this, this uh, uh, spectrum from imminent to projective, uh, that I think an architect works there. You know, that you're, you're basically doing, you know, so if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at a really beautiful set of working drawings, even at the far end of, you know, working drawings are only there, you know, the building is worked out, they're only there to describe a construction. It still has a quality in and of itself. And at the other end, you know, we do things, I certainly do within my practice, and there would be work behind all of the things I show you, where uh, it doesn't necessarily, you don't even know what project it relates to or if it's for a project at all, but one does it not autonomously, but quasi-autonomously. In other words, it's not all the way at this end, but somewhere it's there. And I suppose a kind of simplistic diagram of it as you're working on a project, you imagine you go from working through things that are relatively um, uh, non-projective to things that are extremely projective with the goal being that you have a building, which of course is all the way at, at imminence and is not projective at all. Uh, so a couple of things, these are one of a series of urban drawings that I did when I was in Rome. Um, and, and this is another set. Uh, and this is a, a paired set 
Uh, and, and these were, I suppose somewhere, there, there, was, there was this idea of um, certain kinds of systems being put forward, but they were put forward into a space that was not commensurate with it. In other words, you could never simply put the system forward into that space, and so there was that distinction or that disconnect between the intentionality of a system and the unpredictability of its result. And this was actually sort of surfing in that space between them. This was called uh, Material Consequences, was the name of the series. Uh, and I thought of, to go back to our discussion from this morning, I thought of these very much as, on one hand, a kind of urban uh, possibility, which is to say, what does it mean if you have distinct formal operations, but you play them out in a territory where they cannot simply continue untrammeled, but have to uh, accommodate something else. These are just very, they're very small, actually. They're just uh, ink on paper with brush. Um, and just briefly, a project that came directly out of that, which is a, a, another lost competition for a large high school in, in uh, New Jersey, uh, Perth Amboy High School. So this, this became a way to make all of these, uh, I, I want to show this. Um, I just showed, so this, this, uh, I think so. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show one project, then uh, something that was very quickly, and then I'm gonna show a little movie. That'll be it. That's okay, good time for that? <laughs> okay, I don't wanna, I don't wanna bore anyone. Um, and this is something I talked about. I'm, I don't mean to keep referring to what I talked about earlier, except I, I see a lot of you I recognize from the last couple of days, so uh, forgive me if, if uh, I'm referencing conversations that you didn't hear. But in the review yesterday, we were talking about this idea of a theater and, and uh, what it meant to reorganize things. This was, um, for, first off, this is a project, it's, it's called Cypher, uh, and it was done, uh, some of you may know, when Eric Moss took over CyArk, uh, in their new building, the longest school of architecture in, in uh, the world. Uh, they have um, a gallery in there, and the decision was not to have architects exhibit in the gallery, but rather to have them do installations. So there's been a whole series, I think it's like five a year, in fact, Suzanne did one just last year? Last year. Uh, Suzanne and Mario did one last year, uh, uh, and uh, mine actually ended up being the first in the gallery. There was a uh, office, Da had done an installation, but it was in another space. Mine was the first in the gallery before I even went back to start teaching there when Eric had first taken over. And so what I thought was very interesting, in fact, I'm, I'm very late on writing an essay for a new book that Sayark is going to put out on it. My essay is called Useless. And uh, because the interesting thing about the project is that it's useless. And, and you know, I, I was thinking the, the right, isn't it? but it's strange. And as a result, what, how one answers that question of what to do in a space like that is, is, is um, befuddling. Um, I started thinking about a kind of, uh, I, I thought it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be uh, an installation, I didn't want to call it installation, I called it a temporary project, that it should be a work of architecture, and that it should be thought through as a kind of work of architecture, it's only one that's going to last for a short period of time. Uh, and I started thinking about even like going back to Aldo Rossi and thinking about the theater as the kind of analogous city. And, and uh, I'm thinking of another project that, that's fascinated me since I did my, my thesis in, in graduate school, which is the Anatomy Theater at the University of Padova. I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a theater. It's a theater built inside of an existing building, which is the, the Palazzo Bo, which was a big Renaissance, massive palazzo. And inside of it, there's this tiny, tiny um, wooden theater that's inserted into it. It was the first anatomy theater in the world. Uh, this is very much a kind of fisheye picture of it. It's a, just a tiny vertical space like this that you're, you're packed in there. Uh, and so there's a, there's a um, um, uh, it's a fantastically intense, tiny project put into a massive space. And Sayark is, is big and concrete, and I thought it would be nice to, to find something like that. At the same time, thinking about it then as a theater, but also as a kind of urbanism. And, and at the same time, you can understand these two images as two contradictory ideas, contradictory and equally valid ideas of urbanism, and maybe this relates to the, the urban studies thing. The, the anatomy theater, let's say, there's, we can understand that architectural space uh, is in, within cities is made by form. 
uh, there's a contrary thought that says the space of a city is made by the life and activity of the city. Right? So we have the monument on one hand and we have the agora on the other. Right? And, and there's a certain school of thought that's a fascination with the agora. You know, that what, what is the, the permutation, permutating mix of activities and movements and, and mapping out these various trajectories of cities. So we see on the, on the left is a, a photograph of Bryant Park in New York on a spring day where you start to see space itself is just simply made by the arrangements of bodies. Uh, whereas in the other one, it's very much strongly formed by the architecture. And the idea of Cypher was, is it possible to co-produce space through, at the confluence of, of form and, and um, uh, space. So, it, so the thought was, if you think of it, um, uh, the kind of classical model would be this, uh, the, the agora and the monument, right? The monument is permanent, fixed, referent, and, and the agora as a, a transitory space of movement. And I thought, what if you changed your kind of sensibility of things, right? If, if we had a, if we had a, 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 a third millennium a sensibility of it, we understand first off that matter, as I was saying, not only no two snowflakes are like, all matter is a kind of provisional state, whether one looks at it across, if one radically changes the time or the, the degree of, of observation of it, uh, the monument starts to become less and less corporeal. And if on the other hand, one starts looking at the agora over a very, very long period of time, uh, let's say an extended time-lapse photograph of it. So if you did a kind of um, uh, um, uh, atomic uh, scan of the monument on the right, and if you did a long-term time-lapse photograph of the agora on the left, eventually they would start to have the same density. So this, was, this would be the idea that form and function at some level are not opposites. It's not a dichotomy that form blends seamlessly into function, right? You all sitting there are form right now, and this building is form, and you may be there for three hours, uh, and, and this may be here for, it's been was built like 50 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, right. This is built a long, long time ago. But, but, uh, uh, but, you know, it's relative, right? So th this would be a kind of contemporary sensibility. So anyway, and, and this goes back to a series of other projects. This is a study model for uh, uh, the extension to the Prado Museum, which I lost. Uh, an extension, this was the, the, the Kansai Library competition, which was also space made out of this uh, confluence, where something was the, sol the solidity and the, the void of it was unclear. Kansai, wait, I'm trying to remember. I lost that one. Uh, this is a little pavilion for Detroit, uh, made out of burned houses. Uh, this was a, it wasn't actually was. These are two pavilions I did at the same time. Uh, this was another one which is built, and I'm not showing it uh, tonight, but it's a pavilion for an organization called the Greening of Detroit. So this was also this idea where, so not only form and function, so you, 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 you think that matter doesn't have to be A or B, on or off a wall or space, that you could actually have condition C, where it's difficult to say whether it's one or the other. In some of those other projects, it was, it was formal. In the case of the Greening Pavilion, and I was going to show it, and, and I didn't, uh, it wouldn't be a three and a half hour lecture. The, uh, the, they, they needed a, this a small park, they had classes there with children, they needed a pavilion that would hold off the rain and the sun. And so it's entirely composed of polycarbonate tubes that are clear and they don't touch each other. But uh, through the dispersal of matter, first off, you have enough of them that eventually it becomes opaque so the sun doesn't come through. And then the top of each one has a slot in it, and they're all hanging from a grid. They're uh, about 10 meters long is the length of it. So when the water comes through, even though there's a small gap, every drop hits a tube, goes to the bottom, and drips into the one below it. So even in a pouring rain, you can stand under there, and actually no rain goes through. All the tubes are angled, and it just goes out the end, leaving very dirty deposits of Detroit air. See all the dirt that goes from all the water pouring out the end? We have to go in there. I had to design a giant cleaner, like a test tube cleaner. <laughs> and they go out there every year with these. Uh, and that's a problem with the dispersal of matter in space. It's very hard to clean. But other than that, it's, it's a great idea. Um, so I remember the first image that I sent to, to uh, Eric Moss was this. I thought uh, uh, a three-dimensional Busby Berkeley. Okay. Um, that you would just have people sort of, this whole space would be made out of people sort of dancing in space. He started figuring out the infrastructure to hold them in there and you realize that there's a lot of infrastructure. And so I got very interested in it. So the, the drawings that I was showing you from Rome, the little black ink drawings, they really started here in Cypher. And uh, what I did was, um, yeah, so here. 
reverse order. Uh, in, in the same way, I, I imagined a, uh, I'll, I'll show the project, but a very dense grid that would fit inside of the SciArc space, and that there were a series of uh, walkways, staircases, and railings within it. That was a system. These are studies. Each sheet of paper represents two studies, and each study represents 10 sections stacked on top of each other. Uh, here they go. Oh, there they go. Um, and you would go through, and it was funny, it was the same thing. It wasn't exactly like a process, because if it didn't come out the way I would want to do it, I would do it again. Does that make sense? But at the same time, I could never make it come out exactly the way I wanted to, because I set up enough variables in there where it was not never quite predictable. And the one you see on the right is the one that we finally ended up uh, building. Uh, and so what it is, is it's, uh, it's uh, 20 by 20 by... Uh, Oh, it was, the gallery's about half the size of this room, and uh, maybe uh, as tall, not as tall, somewhere between the, the cornice and the, the fabric, right? like this. Uh, and there's a, there's a walkway up there that's open into it. So I built 10 of these sections, and they're all made out of just very, very cheap wood. It was a kind of a uh, Southern California thing. Uh, but each one of these sections would be built into that pattern, and so there was a kind of labyrinth that existed inside of there. Uh, and, and it was such, this is the, how it fits in the gallery space. This goes back to the question of the sectional object. I always thought, at least with a gallery, you could get out of the Russian doll problem because you're not responsible for the outside of the building. So everything that I was responsible for was the space between the inside wall and the piece itself. But it wasn't hanging on anything, it wasn't attached to anything. It sat in the middle of the space with only about less than, less than a meter, maybe this much space around it. And in fact, along here, there's a wall. You can stand here and look down, but there's a wall. So once it, it's closed, it was such that even though it's an object, you could never actually see it. The only time you could see it is when you were very, very close to it, and you would actually lose the, the perspective of it. So it goes back to the Bruno aficionados back to the Library of Alexandria, where we did a a stack of uh, library books and put that into the main hall so one could never see the books they existed in. A kind of extreme version, I guess, of the Beinecke Library at Yale, for those of you that know that, that um, SOM project. So to show you then as a series, this progression, a series of sections when you walk into the gallery from this side, uh, and then you know as you, as you walk through it makes a kind of musical notation. In fact, I'll talk about the programming of it in a minute, and that's where it deals with the, the theater idea. Uh, but the, the, the anatomy theater, that was not a proscenium arch theater, but still it was this idea that, of, of a perspectival theater. That is to say there was a central point where the cadaver was laid out, and the entire geometry of the theater was based on separating the spectator from the thing being spectated, and using geometry to create a perspective, to create a, a clear relationship between the two. The thought here was, as a theater, that we should change the arrangement of that, so that the, the, the body, not only the, the form and the figures are intertwined within each other, but also the spectator and the audience for it. Just some pictures of its construction. We dyed it all black. Uh, worked with a group of, I think, the, the skinniest students I've ever seen at SciArc. <laughs> Built it, and yet somehow... Uh, <laughs> But you get a sense there, even at the top, you couldn't stand on top of it. You could go up there, but you couldn't stand, you had to crouch. And then the, the walking surfaces were just the intensification of the same grid. Even the staircases were just a sort of intensification of that grid. <coughs> And then, so th this is the, the real main idea. And it, it was made to work empty, but it was ideal when it was full. And this is from the opening. Uh, we worked with a, a, uh, a group called Line Space Line, which is an experimental music consortium in Los Angeles. And uh, they came and performed a piece during the entire opening that lasted about an hour and a half. But the way it happened is they actually came in ahead of time and arranged themselves throughout the space. And then as the opening happened, you could walk into it. So we had 60 people in this thing at some point. And while you were walking through it, the performance was literally happening above you, behind you, and, and 
uh, on, on all sides of you, which was exactly, so it was, not a, it was not a theater in which any kind of music could be performed, but in fact, there was some music that was perfect for it. In fact, the leader of the group, when he saw those drawings that were the notation, he goes, oh, some of us, we make, we, we draw, our music looks just like that. I'll show you our, um, that's the top. It was also it was very hot, and it was also the air conditioning ducts were up there, so it was very popular to hang out. Uh, and then uh, there's a choreographer in, in Los Angeles, Anita Pace, and she did a, she she wrote a dance for this piece. Uh, this was for the closing. She also introduced a series of uh, sheets of scrim and, and had projections on it together with the dancers. The the, the last uh, thing, just so briefly, these are were new. Uh, these are a series of, uh, I call them elevation studies, and, and they deal, I suppose, with limits of figuration um, and legibility. Uh, and these are, there's two box versions, and then it eventually got into four box versions. These are all assemblages from the actual boxes. They're not woven, they're actually put together, but jointed like this. So you have four boxes unfolded and when you put it together it's as big as all four of them put together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's recycling, there's not one scrap of cardboard, not even this big left over. They're, they're a bit obsessive. Um, the, the coloring is important on these. It's very strange, as Jeff was saying, this is like uh, that there's two, two painting sensibilities, the still life and the landscape, and he thought that these actually found this strange kind of um, other zone between the two of them. This one actually I just finished. Uh, there's an organization called LACE in Los Angeles, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. I donated this for their auction. It's going to be online. LACE is a wonderful organization. You can bid on it. <laughs> Quite. And then I'll, I'll, I don't have the, this is already a huge file, I'll just, I, have, I have a separate window open with the, uh, the video that I'll show you. Uh, um, going back to, to Kristen's introduction about some of these other studies. So, you know, drawing, drawing has the lion's share, uh, drawing has a lion's share of, of uh, or the, 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 the lion's share of importance in the history of, the technique of working through architecture, the technique of, of architectural space. Uh, increasingly, first off, I mean, other, unless they're, they're particular studies, um, it's, not, it's a silly thing to sit around and draft. I don't think that's really like a, a useful activity to do anymore. Um, I was really, really good at it, but you know, it's like a, being good at, I don't know what, carving wooden shoes or I don't know what. <laughs> so, I, can, I can do it for like a, as a tourist business. Um, but you know the, the questions of space are, are interesting. So this there's a series of studies that, that come out of uh, a couple of things. Wanting to capture a certain sensibility of Detroit. I've done a number of things in Detroit. I'm showing so many of them now. But at the same time, trying to um, so there's a particular project agenda, which is to say that the nature of the space of Detroit is um, quite tangible yet difficult to grasp onto. Uh, I had started thinking about ways of doing these kinds of urban scapes. Uh, I suppose with the uh, a project I had some work in, this is called Shrinking Cities. I forgot how you say it in German, but it, it originated in Berlin. I don't think it came to Vienna, but it traveled around other parts of Europe. It was in the United States, it was in Detroit. Um, Philip Oswald um, was, was the organizer of it. I proposed this, but at the time, they didn't have the money. I told them it's going to cost a lot of money, and I had actually no idea how to do it, so I kept working on it for several years. And, and um, it, uh, I guess it goes into the notion of the dimensionality of space. In other words, uh, you know, you work on a two-dimensional sheet of paper, and within that sheet of paper, there's ways of creating uh, projections of other, of other dimensions, right? That's what a, a perspective in that sense, or an axonometric, is a three-dimensional shadow onto a two-dimensional, a, a, a two-dimensional shadow of a three-dimensional space. And if you think of a movie, a movie is, um, uh, three-dimensional, if you consider time to be the last dimension, does that make sense? So you have the X and Y of the screen, and then the duration. So, and then it has perspective also, so it's a uh, uh, three-dimensional 
shadow of four-dimensional space. Does that make sense? I, does anyway, these are the sorts of things I obsess over. And, and I was trying to imagine is there a way of sort of re reworking that in, in the context of. And instead of looking at a lot of things, there, there's a, there's a um, sort of an interesting history of uh, working through, um, on one end is the, the history of the urban panorama, you know, the panoramic, the cyclical panoramic paintings uh, and large scale paintings of urbanism. But it does come into questions of space. This is, uh, um, well, this is actually the, the, this, the, this is the sunset, the Ed Ruscha, uh, Los Angeles artist, every address on Sunset Strip from the early 60s, where he went and took a photograph of every single street address on Sunset Strip. He is one of the small art books that would unfold out, you know, seven feet long. And uh, uh, quite interesting. And, and uh, it was a, uh, like a continuous elevation of that street. Uh, more recently, this is Stan Douglas, uh, an artist out of uh, Vancouver. This was a few years ago. Uh, the 100 block of Hastings Street in Vancouver. Just a Vancouver guy around here. Uh, and, and here, the interesting thing is it becomes smooth. The individual fragments of the Ed Ruscha here become smooth, and, and I think I know exactly how he did it. Uh, but, but that idea of the conflation of motion, time, and its separation and combination, and the, the, the playing of those things, uh, it goes to, to, to the, the history of modernism and, and before. This is, of course, Murray and, and also Moybridge's studies in, in uh, motion. Of course, the, the suits of uh, Murray uh, when he would photograph stop motion of people running and people fencing. Uh, you know, if you think of uh, Duchamp's nude descending a staircase, this goes, or, or some of the Italian futurist work, this goes to the absolute heart of, of sort of modernist sensibilities. Uh, in fact, L'Artigue, the, uh, the, the, the Grand Prix at Deep from the 1912, uh, and this is always shown as one of the icons of modernism. This is the idea of speed. Uh, the idea of motion. Uh, it turns out there's a very exact re reason why the wheel is in the lips and everyone is leaning backwards. Uh, and the entire category is called the slit scan. And uh, the, I could actually diagram out for you the kind that in fact this picture is taken in time. There's no such thing as a snapshot that is instantaneous. It takes some fraction of a second. During that fraction of a second, the camera was turning this way. The car was passing even faster. And if you imagine a line scanning through the shot as that was happening, you can do the math and figure out that that's exactly where this came from. So this goes past in the array and the fragmentation into a kind of smoother thing. In fact, that, that idea of the slit scan, this is uh, Douglas, Douglas Trumbull, that the, I was trying to remember if I had his name right uh, this afternoon, who did all the special effects for 2001, The Space Odyssey. Uh, he did, yeah. He figured out a way of doing a film that was a slit scan where basically you can, I don't know how to describe it other than let's say you look at a film sideways. Uh, he was able to do that and take film and, and by hand with a very large and complicated machine and this is it. He could manually expose little slits of film at a time and expose thousands of films and eventually come up with the whole space warp scene of, of, uh, of 2001. Um, what ours is, is uh, and, and it is basically that, if you imagine, um, you know a flip book? Uh, and this is the last image and I'll show the, the, the slide. You have each, each image is a different layer of space. And so you have eventually, let's say, a, a two-dimensional image followed by two-dimensional image. You stack it up and you actually have a three-dimensional block. Uh, you can actually take that block and instead of looking at it this way, you can look at it this way. Some version of a, a slit scan is, is that. Uh, and and uh, we, we wrote software uh, in order to do it and use this as a way of documenting. And it turns out, I won't go into the particulars of it, but for, for that new film to have coherence, there has to be some combination of movement of the camera and or the subject. I'll leave it at that. Uh, the reason I'm showing this, this is an installation at SciArc. This is very much a kind of beta thing that I'm going to show you. It's, it's an extremely, extremely high resolution film and in its, we're, we're making the, the final version of it now. Uh, in this installation it was about 40 feet across, that's again 12 meters maybe, uh, shown on three projectors next to each other. When it's done in its final resolution it will be maybe two and a half times that size and so the height of the film will be, you know, uh, 
like three meters, maybe two or three meters. Uh, so you're, I'm, I'm only going to show these films here, it's on a very small screen, but just to give you an idea of, of the kind of uh, motion of these tableaus. Okay, and um, then when this is done, that's it. And this runs a few minutes, I don't know, six or seven minutes. Uh, each, each one of these, uh, each film uh, lasts the same amount of time, because that's the width of the flipbook. You can make the flipbook as long as you want, but it's only so wide, it depends on the camera. And so the length of these change, but the, the duration of the film always ends up being the same. Uh, and and uh, each one is a different block of the city of Detroit. Uh, these blocks are all within, oh, a, a couple of them two to four kilometers of the center of the city. Uh, I, I mean, a whole, a whole separate lecture would be Detroit and, and the things happening there. This is all the old Packard automobile plant. One tiny fragment of it, it, it continues on for many blocks uh, and crosses over. You can see a bridge there with an assembly line crossed over roads. It was originally, this was so big, it was this factory that people used to call Motor City. So that, that's actually where the, uh, the term came from. Uh, you know, it's you need statistics, but it's, you know, it, it, it is now, at its peak, it had about two million people uh, at the, at the, immediately after World War II. Uh, it now has something considerably less than 900,000, depends what month you're counting. <laughs> uh, and and uh, something like 40% of the city is laying uh, vacant, uh, empty, or, or yeah, these, these are all empty buildings as well. Uh, and the scale, the scale of the disinvestment of the city is quite shocking. It's in fact tying back to the notion of the accident. When I saw the Virilio show, I understood that first off they have a form, which was not such the subject of the show, but there's a form to it. I also understood that if you define it as the moment where you have a certain projected technological intention, and then there is another set of conditions that were not intended that lead to its unraveling, it doesn't have to happen in that split second of an accident, of a, of a car crash, that you can have, you know, there's not only the, the car that can have a crash, the car city can also have a crash. Uh, it just may take 30 years, but if, you can follow through really the same kind of process because it was really a city that was, had transformed itself into a certain kind of production machine. Uh, and that production then hit other kinds of things instead of, uh, uh, instead of hitting air pocket, it hit, it hit some combination of uh, obsolescence and racism and, and uh, gave us the Detroit we all know and love. I wish it was, again, you, 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 there's quite a lot of detail in this. One of the peculiar artifacts, this is actually one car. Four different places, sometimes going backwards, sometimes going forward. The, uh, articulation, again, this is very close to the center of the city. There's a, at the, at the uh, turn of the last century, the ring-necked pheasant, the bird, the game bird, disappeared from the city. And about uh, 15 years ago, flocks reappeared in the middle of, in the middle of Detroit. You'll just see flocks of pheasants crossing the street. Sort of funny, this area is also popular with prostitutes. Sort of the, of the, uh, I guess it's sort of crack addicted variety as opposed to that. Uh, yeah, they kept coming up and wanting to help us with the filming. And it's like I was saying, I was already in a movie earlier today. Can I be in this one too? <laughs> <laughs> These are, uh, and you see some of the kind of wavy artifacts on the top and the bottom. Um, to produce these, uh, we have to set up, we do it without film licenses or anything. So we get a group of people, we get, um, you know, like a tracking shot like you would do in Hollywood where you have a cart and, you know, going along. We basically make our own out of 
wood and, and, and uh, PVC pipe. Uh, but we make five or six hundred feet of this, uh, 180, 200 meters of this, and we would have to go very early in the morning and we would take over an entire block and just set it up and fit it all together. Uh, but then you have to spend almost the entire day making it level because in order for this to work, it ne really needs to be like a dead level shop. Uh, and then film it and then dismantle it all and get it off the street or it'll all be gone the next day. Uh, and uh, it, it's quite a challenge and, and we don't get it perfect. And so what we do is we work with uh, Final Cut and, and Motion in particular, which is amazing because it can actually take a jiggly camera and you can identify a certain thing in it and it'll actually go through frame by frame and it has some you know uh, analog software that that can read that form and adjust each frame to put that in the same line it's quite interesting so once you look at it sideways that's actually all of the frames that have been adjusted that's why some of them we have to redo we, it, it it was more of a sway in it than we had uh, in that. i think this is the last one these are my favorite Thank you.